So before I uh, move on to correlation, I just wanted to kind of bring this whole analysis of variance discussion, I wanted to bring it full circle. And um, these are the results of our analyses uh, that we uh, conducted the last time. And, but I wanted to bring us back to the initial discussion of analysis of variance. When I talked about two problems um, that occurred that would occur if we did a series of multiple t-tests. So we came up with two reasons why we needed to develop a new statistical test. Do you remember what they were? Let's, let's cover them, right? So one of the reasons for analysis of variance, and that is the reasons that we don't do multiple t-tests, one of the reasons is that we wanted to avoid uh, inflating our chances of making a type 1 error. Okay. Remember, if we did multiple t-tests, each time we did a t-test, we would have a 5% chance of making a type 1 error, and so if we do multiple t-tests, we're going to inflate that chance, okay? We're going to inflate that. It's called the error rate. We're going to inflate that error rate. So one of the reasons that we wanted to avoid inflating, uh, excuse me, we wanted to do a analysis of variance is to avoid inflating that um, type 1 error rate. And the other reason, do you remember, we wanted to uh, pool variability from all groups in the experiment to get the best guess for sigma, right? So even when we're doing, when we're comparing uh, groups A and B, we want to pool the variability from A, B, C, D, E, however many groups there are, because that will give us our best guess for sigma, since all of those samples should be giving us some kind of a guess for sigma. So these are the two reasons for doing analysis of variance rather than doing multiple t-tests, okay? And so we started off with these concerns. But then we got kind of maybe lost in the woods a little bit by doing all the computations. And so I wanted to sort of bring us around to these two uh, reasons and show you where in the analysis of variance we take care of each of these. Okay? So I'm going to start with reason number two here. So we wanted to pool the variability from all the groups to get our best guess for sigma. Well, we get that best guess right here, okay? We get that best guess from our within groups mean square term. And if you recall when we did our analysis of variance, this was equal to the sum of all of the sum of squares for each group, okay? And so it's taking the variability from group A, group B, group C, group D, group E, however many groups there are, and it's pooling those together. So this right here, this is what gives us our best guess for sigma. And in fact, from all the numbers in the analysis of variance summary table, this is the only one that we bring with us when we do our post hoc analysis. Okay, there it is right there. That's the only number from this table that we bring further along, and that's because it addresses this um, issue, okay? That is the pool variability from all the groups, and we can then go and do our pairwise, pairwise comparisons, okay? So that takes care of the second reason why we're doing the analysis of variance. And in fact, I had mentioned in a previous video 
that when I was working as a research assistant, I asked the professor, I said, well, why, you know, why are we doing the analysis of variance if we need to then go further and do a post hoc um, analysis? And I soon found out that, well, this is why we're doing it. In fact, my personal belief is that the most important number of all of this analysis of variance table is right here. And I think that's easily arguable because it's the only one that shows up when we do our post hoc tests. Okay. All right. What about this? What about avoiding uh, the inflation of our type one error rate? Um, how does that get accomplished when we do our analysis of variance? Well, this one's a little bit harder to see. I'm hoping that you understand this because if you go back to the formula, you see that it adds up the sum of squares for each of the groups. Um, what about this one? What about number two? Well, believe it or not, here's the number right here that we're going to use to avoid inflating our uh, error rate, avoid increasing our chances of making a type one error. And that's because this will adjust, I mean, it's a mathematical way to adjust for the inflation. Remember Tukey's HSD, right? Tukey's HSD, this is the number, that's how far two means have to be apart for us to reject the null, okay? If we had, in our case, if we had more than four groups, this number would increase. If we had more than four groups, this number would increase, okay? And that would make it harder to reject the null. If this number increased, then this number would increase. It would make it harder to reject the null, okay? Because there are more, if we had more than four groups, we'd have more than six pairwise comparisons, okay? If we had five or six treatment groups, we would be able to do all sorts of pairwise comparisons. That is, lots of times we're playing Russian roulette, right? If we're going to use that an analogy. So this number, the Q, when we do Q times mean square within, also known as mean squares error, that Q is what adjusts our alpha level. It mathematically adjusts so that the more groups that we have, the more difficult it is to reject the null. That helps us to avoid this inflation of type 1 error. Okay? So believe it or not, you know, we start with the conceptual like we've always done, and then we sort of fill in with the computational. But I wanted to go back sort of full circle and talk about what components of our analysis corresponded to um, dealing with these. So it's the Q, it's the Q from our Tukey's HSD that helps us do this, and it's the mean squares error that helps us do this, okay? So that's the full circle and uh, short video uh, but I just wanted to wrap that up, and then we're going to start talking about um, correlation.